Good morning. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today, and we're going to attempt to cover most of this chapter. So it's a decent chunk here as we look at the day of Pentecost. Now, because there is so much scripture, some, some parts of this here I'm going to really be running through, but I just want to make sure we understand the significance of this day, uh, and then what really happened, and what Peter was laying out here in his sermon, uh, and why people responded as they did, as the Lord does an absolutely incredible thing, and kicks off the church, so to speak, uh, and what he has in store for all those who belong to him, in the name of Jesus. So let's read here in Acts chapter 2. Uh, I broke this into two parts, so we're going to start with verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native tongue? Parthians and Medes, uh, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pause here and thank the Lord for his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word proclaims the wondrous works of your mighty hand, the incredible things that you and you alone do in this world and in and through our lives. May we not in any capacity or any way doubt the miraculous nature of your mighty hand, that nothing is too hard for you. For not only can you speak as you see fit, can not only can you move and work in mighty ways, the Lord, you, you have saved us. You have taken sinners like us, redeemed us, and made us yours. What an incredible thing you have done. May we give all glory to your name today as we consider your word, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, Peter and all the disciples were gathered together once again in prayer when the day of Pentecost arrived. The Feast of Pentecost was one of three annual Old Testament celebrations during which the men of Israel were expected to come to Jerusalem to worship there at the temple in some way. 
It was a time when Jews also from around the world would gather in their ancient homeland and offer these sacrifices to the Lord. And others who admired the Jews or maybe had even converted, in a sense, to being a Jew and worshiping like the Jews would certainly not miss a celebration like this. Pentecost was a harvest festival coming at the time of the grain harvest, which just happened to be 50 days after the celebration of Passover. This means that all those people who were required to come to Jerusalem for the Passover, all those people who had seen and talked about Christ's death and resurrection, were now back together in Jerusalem again 50 days later. And they had come this time to bring their tithes and offerings to the temple, offering the first fruits of their harvest with joy and thanksgiving. It was no accident that God chose the day of Pentecost for the initiation of Jesus' followers into this new great adventure of faith. After spending the last 50 days, well, first in confusion and darkness, then in wonder and amazement, and now in expectation and prayer, these early believers have been prepared by our Lord for a great harvest of everlasting life. The first fruits of a harvest won through Christ's death and resurrection. These first believers were about to be touched by the Spirit of God in an incredible way. They were to be the first of a vast multitude, the first of millions upon millions who would follow them into a unique relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. The choice of Pentecost was a clear indication of the meaning of this new relationship for believers. You see, during the Feast of Pentecost, there was a particular passage of Scripture in the book of De Deuteronomy that would have been regularly read and quoted during this time of worship on this day. This passage was from Deuteronomy chapter 26, and it was read because it was a reminder of the reason for this feast as well as an instruction guide on how they were to worship this day. And this passage instructs each worshiper to go to a priest and say the words from Deuteronomy 26, verse 3, which say, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. You see, the day of Pentecost was all about celebrating the fact that God had finally given his people the inheritance he had promised them, and then submitting the fruit of that inheritance to him as a demonstration and as evidence of his faithfulness to them. And on this particular Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, God finally fully guaranteed the complete inheritance of his people when he poured out his spirit on those early believers. And the first fruits of this inheritance was demonstrated in the salvation of the 3,000 souls who chose to trust Christ in faith that day. You see, this, this is what Pentecost meant to those first disciples, and this is what it should mean for us today. Through Jesus, we have entered into everything the promised land in Israel had foreshadowed, and we are now free to experience the fullness of all the things the Lord our God has chosen to give us because of the grace of Christ that was bought for us at the cross. You know, Scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, that the Holy Spirit is our seal, our deposit guaranteeing our inheritance in Christ. It reads there, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. You see, the scripture is clear. Our true inheritance is that of the kingdom, the eternal kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth that we will spend forever with our Savior in, serving and worshiping and living. And the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of that inheritance, our assurance that that is our home, that the true promised land has been given to us. And you know, the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit as a person, an individual distinct from and yet one with the Father and Son. 
as God, the Holy Spirit, had various relationships with men in Old Testament times, particularly the prophets. But the Old Testament also spoke of a coming day when God would enter into a new and special relationship with those who believe. Jesus had also spoken often of this. In fact, Christ looked forward to a day when he would be back with the Father and the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive, would be given. The promised Spirit was to teach and guide believers, and according to Jesus' final promise, to bring power for that new kind of life, which bears witness to Jesus' final promise, and to the reality of who he is. In that day, Jesus had said the Spirit would not simply be with his disciples, but in them. And here that day had come. And clearly the Spirit didn't just sneak in a notice there, but there are several clear things that happened in this moment that unmistakably mark this day. We got the sound of a mighty wind that rushed through that room where those believers were gathered. The flames or tongues of fire that flickered over each head. And as the Spirit filled them, individuals began to speak in languages they did not know. And all of this, the wind, the fire, the speaking in these languages, drew a great crowd of those men who had come to Jerusalem for this Pentecost festival. And each person, regardless of their homeland, heard the disciples speaking in their own native language. A miraculous thing. How is it, wondered the visitors, that each one of us hears them in his own native tongue? We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, they said. They were confused. This was absolutely an incredible miracle. The implication here being that the disciples were simply speaking and three different people speaking three different languages would hear those words in a way they understood. It was like an undoing of the Tower of Babel, the exact opposite of such. Where there had once been confusion, there was understanding. But the crowd was still perplexed because they knew what was happening was significant. They knew this was a miracle and a sign. There was no question of that. But it was a matter of what was this exactly a sign of? Some onlookers there who had seen all this assumed that they were drunk. Maybe they had partied a little too much last night as part of their festivities. But the wind and the fire were there as signs of assurance to the believers that the Holy Spirit was present. And the languages were a sign to everyone else that God was doing something new and incredible. And this was how Peter responded to those who demanded an explanation of the disciples. After making it clear that it was only the third hour, meaning about nine in the morning, and the disciples certainly weren't drunk, he quotes from the prophet Joel. In fact, he quotes quite a bit from the prophet Joel here. As he reads there saying, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That great gift which God had reserved till the last days was being poured out freely now. All who truly knew God were to know the touch of the Spirit of God. Both daughters and sons would be empowered by Him. Most significant of all, in that day in which the Spirit of God would flow out and touch and fill God's own, and God would do miraculous things in His people, in the world, and in the heavens He lays out. The most incredible thing, though, is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This day was so incredibly significant. God was moving out beyond the boundaries of Israel to offer to all people that relationship with himself, which is at the heart of eternal life. The nature of the languages spoken is evidence of that. If Jesus had only come and the Spirit had only come to save Jews, the disciples would have only spoken in Hebrew. But instead, their words were heard by all, because this good news was for all men. It was a day of salvation. It was the first harvest work day for the Spirit of God to the glory of Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, quite often, the most emphasized aspect of this day isn't the redeeming work of the glory of our Lord, but the resulting miraculous displays of God's power that were, both, that were but signs of the fact that the Spirit was here and doing what the Spirit came to do. 
The displays of the power of the Holy Spirit on this day of Pentecost have captivated both believers and non-believers and left many hungry to see similar miraculous displays manifested in their own lives. In fact, some people have become so focused on some of these particular gifts of grace that the Holy Spirit bestowed on these early believers that day, they've become literally obsessed with trying to obtain them continually begging God to manifest himself in these specific ways or to bless them with a particular gift or ability. But you know, these last several weeks, we have been reminded in, in the book of Acts that God works for his purposes and not our own. That he operates in his time, not ours. Also recognize today that his power and might is not at work in this world for us to personally possess control, manipulate, or direct. The Holy Spirit isn't some magical force from a movie. The Holy Spirit is God. The disciples here did not tell the Holy Spirit what to do. They were not in that room that morning demanding that God show himself in their lives in this particular way. They were simply in that room praying together in one accord, humble and submissive to the word and will of God. They were not praying so that they could get God to do something miraculous. They knew that God would deliver on his promise in his time and his way. They were praying together out of obedience and submission to the will of Christ. Jesus had told them in Acts chapter 1 to wait in Jerusalem for the promised counselor. They didn't know who this counselor was. They didn't know how he was going to come. They were simply prayerfully and obediently ready and available for what the Lord had in store. You see, this special day wasn't about who the disciples were or what they were able to do. This special day was about the reaping of a harvest of souls for the glorification of Jesus Christ. The most important thing about this day wasn't that sound of the blowing wind. It wasn't those strange tongues of fire. It wasn't even all those languages that the people heard from the disciples' mouths by the power of the Spirit. The most important thing about this day was that the name of Jesus was lifted up and glorified as his people submitted to the will and work of the Heavenly Father. When it comes down to it, this day was all about Jesus. Look at what Peter told those who were questioning what God was doing that day. He explained to the Jews that this was the fulfillment of prophecy. And then Peter proceeds to tell them how Jesus of Nazareth had fulfilled the prophecies in the scriptures that they had spent their lives reading. Let's read the rest of Peter's proclamation here and what he says about Jesus in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. 
this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day, about 3,000 souls. Peter's sermon here was all about Jesus. As Peter ultimately proclaimed in there, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucify. You know, Peter begins here by reminding them of the miracles Jesus had done. All the things with which most of these people likely would have seen, if not at the very least heard of. He reminded them of the crucifixion just 50 days before. And he proclaimed the resurrection, supported by King David's prophecy. He laid out, you know, David's dead. That prophecy wasn't about himself, but about Jesus Jesus is the, mix, the Messiah. Jesus has been exalted, and the promised Holy Spirit has come and is present here, just as David proclaimed. You know, verse 34 there, which is quoting from the Psalms, where it says, The Lord said to my Lord, that is the Father speaking to the Son. Notice here, you know, the Father tells the Son to sit at my right hand. And on this day, at this point, and continuing today, the Son is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. This is a proclamation of victory, the Father assuring the Son that he is bringing everything about just as he has said. Verse 36 then here in Peter's sermon is the ultimate proclamation and the purpose of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the fullness of God's promise, the true inheritance and life that God had assured his people would come, and the harvest of salvation which he had proclaimed. Jesus is Lord, meaning he is God. And he is Christ, meaning he is the Messiah, the Savior, the King. Peter's entire message is built on the foundation of the testimony of Scripture and the witness of Jesus' own life, ministry, and death, which once again, those listening to this, had all largely personally observed. And then it's capped off with Peter and the disciples' own witness of Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Peter is clearly proclaiming the reality of who Jesus is. And hearing this, recognizing that what Peter was saying was true, the people were convicted by the Holy Spirit, cut to the heart, Scripture says. And they were eager, eager to respond to what this good news that Jesus is Lord and Christ was all about. In respond, they did. 3,000 of them were baptized that day. As Peter explained to them, they needed to repent and be baptized in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, assuring them that they too would receive the gift of the Spirit, and letting them know that this promise wasn't just for them, but for the generations to come, as the Lord continued to call and draw people to himself. And you see, our response to the gospel is so important, that we realize that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. That he did come for us. That he did die in our behalf. That he did rise again. That he has brought salvation to us. Have you repented and been baptized? Is the Holy Spirit at work in your life? This promise is for you. For all whom the Lord will call. Is he calling you? There is nothing more important for us to respond to than what the Lord has done for us to respond to Jesus, to trust him in faith, to let him know in prayer that we surrender to him, that we need his grace, and that we are placing our faith, our life, our being in his hands and not living for ourselves any longer, for he is Lord. If the Holy Spirit has called you and is at work in your life, then please recognize why he is with you today. And that is to proclaim the good news and glory of Jesus Christ. 
notice with me here that back up in verse 14 in that first section we read earlier that it says there but Peter standing with the eleven lifted up his voice and addressed them this Peter who just 50 days before when asked if he knew Jesus had forcefully swore he swore that he had never met the man Peter who just 50 days before couldn't even acknowledge Christ before a simple servant girl this Peter who was so ashamed he couldn't even look upon the Lord as Jesus was taken to be crucified this same Peter stood up before a crowd of thousands and declared clearly and unashamedly the truth of Jesus Christ <laughs> realize there are a few key things that have changed in the last 50 days Jesus was alive and the Spirit was with Peter notice though that Peter's courage and eloquence here didn't come from a prepared sermon that he had practiced or rehearsed his confidence that day was not in himself or any ability which he ever possessed frankly before this moment with one noticeable exception nothing eloquent had ever really come out of Peter's mouth he was known for putting his foot in his mouth not impressive discourses Peter's courage that day came entirely from the presence of the Holy Spirit he and the other believers had humbled themselves in dependence and prayer upon the Lord and they had become vessels and instruments of the Holy Spirit useful to the Lord not because of their abilities experiences or training but because of their humble faith and submission to their Savior and King you know we often measure the value of life ours and others based on our perception of usefulness productivity skill or return on investment but the Lord does not call us to go and be useful the Lord calls us to submit to him and then it is his spirit who will determine proclaim and complete whatever useful work the Lord has in store for us in us and through us our aim is not to try and determine where in which we might be the most useful to the Lord but instead to simply to belong to the Lord in every way when our aim church is to belong to him then we will find that when it is time for us to stand and proclaim to worship and serve to love and forgive to surrender and submit that we will have all the courage and humility we need to belong to Jesus Christ and to allow him to do with us as he sees fit Peter concludes here by warning and pleading with the people to save themselves from this corrupt generation I don't think I have to explain to you what is corrupt and wrong in this world as sin continues to multiply in so many ways the question for us is who are we going to belong to this corrupt generation the world around us or Jesus Christ to whom do you belong have you responded to the Holy Spirit's call is it your aim to belong to Christ and he alone or is it to be comfortable useful or practical from your perspective you know we have been given the Holy Spirit the deposit that guarantees our inheritance of faith and so that we might belong completely and entirely to Christ and glorify him both now and forever the Spirit came that day and everything he did was to glorify Jesus and proclaim him as Lord in Christ and the Spirit's purpose remains unchanged that is his desire in and through us to proclaim Jesus as Lord in Christ through the way we live each and every day you know we don't have to wait for heaven to submit to Christ we can know his salvation life and glory now we can belong to him today we can live in light of the inheritance that has been assured to us are you living a life that belongs to Jesus or are you too busy belonging to someone or something else for what matters most is to whom do you belong for the one to whom you belong will determine the rest of your course your actions and your words let's pray Lord thank you for loving us thank you for saving us thank you for not leaving us alone but sending your spirit to work in mighty ways to accomplish your work to do what only you can do in us and through us 
May we not limit our perception of you based on ourselves. May we not allow our perspective of our abilities to get in the way of what you desire to do in us and through us. May we be but humble vessels that courageously in faith trust you and depend upon you, that seek simply to belong to you every day, every moment, in every situation, that we would live for your honor and glory and not our own. We need you, Jesus. Thank you for being with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of Christ and belong to your Savior and Lord each day this week.